was called, Colonel Stone, um, was a native New Yorker. He was, unfortunately, again, like, like a Grenville Dodge, raised in a democratic household in, in New York, and therefore he was imbued with the, the pre-Civil War general attitude of the Democrats toward, toward blacks, although in, in New York it's a, little, it's a little bit different, but not all that different. Uh, he, uh, he was reared a Democrat. Now he comes out to Iowa. He participates vigorously in the formation of the Republican Party in the state. He stands as a, as a Fremont elector in 1856. He served briefly but gallantly in the war as a regimental commander. He survived, he barely survived Grant's great frontal assault on the fortress at Vicksburg, Mississippi. He returned uh, back here uh, to Iowa to recuperate from, from uh, serious wounds. He was elected governor in 1863 and re-elected in 1865. Now, uh, he was known for uh, a very down-to-earth, folksy, gregarious, unpretentious uh, uh, nature. And he Stone um, felt compelled by Democratic baiting about it during his 1865 re-election campaign to discuss the history of his feelings about black equality. And he did so. This was the kind of guy that would lay it out in front of you, uh, you know, like, like Jimmy Carter or someone, you know, not a, not a buttoned up type, but someone who says, yeah, this is how I felt, and I did this, and I did that, and I changed my mind. He talks about this in many of his campaign speeches, and you can pull them all together and get a kind of connected narrative. In, re regard, in regard to black, the black suffrage referendum of, of 1857, he had this to say. He said, in 1857, I voted against it. Not because I was opposed to it as a question of abstract right, but simply on the ground of expediency. I doubted whether we were ready for it. Well, now, you see, which is just to say that he did no more than internalize the prevailing Republican Party line about black, black rights in 1857. We weren't ready for it. Okay. Now the war came, and Stone was at first willing that the war be won without disturbing slavery. Again, the kind of prevailing Republican Party line. Lincoln was going around all, you know, all during the campaign saying, look, we're not going to disturb slavery where it exists legally in the original slave states of the South. We just don't want it in the West, right? So this was the prevailing, uh, this was the prevailing line. We're, we're going to fight a civil war just to keep the Union together. We're not going to do anything where, about slavery where it exists legally, that is, in the 13 original uh, states uh, that, that are still southern states. Uh, and so uh, he, he was not, he didn't want to mess with slavery. As, as a newspaper reporter paraphrased his explanation, quote, he had been rather slow on, upon this subject and he had never been regarded as a strong advocate of emancipation. He had been conservative on this question. He had been raised a Democrat and shared the views of that party. As Stone himself confessed, quote, I was so conservative I did not endorse Lincoln's preparatory proclamation of emancipation as heartily as many did. I questioned his expediency at the time, although by the time when he issued the final proclamation on the 1st of January, 1863, I was fully prepared to sustain it. Now this is interesting because, because note, note what, he's, what he's saying here. This was a rapid mental adjustment to a kind of fait accompli on the part of Abraham Lincoln. In three and a half months, this guy who's not in favor, he's not in favor of, of getting rid of slavery, suddenly he's in favor of it. So he, had rever he reversed his attitude in just a very short time once that became clear that that's what the prevailing gospel, a uh, uh, political gospel was. It was we were going to have emancipation if the South doesn't give up and, and, uh, and that was the administration's policy. Colonel Stone flip-flops on the issue. Now he also felt initially uneasy about the idea of enlisting black troops. He wasn't too sure about this and this again was the, the typical con conservative Republican and, and definitely Democratic line. They did not want black troops to serve in the war. He was not for some reason, again I'm paraphrasing a reporter, he was not for some reasons very much in favor of the organization of colored regiments, but it had been done. And now, uh, after the war, he's talking, he believed that if they would take out of the war what the black men had done in various ways as guides, teamsters, mechanics, laborers, soldiers, he seriously doubted whether we could have conquered the South. Now, he's saying here that without the black military participation of almost 200,000 uh, black, black uh, combat troops plus uh, a whole host of, of assorted uh, other 
support, tr uh, support people uh, that, that the Civil War could have been won. He said, you know, we, we, we'd, we'd still be fighting the war. We'd still be fighting the war if we hadn't enlisted black troops. And of course, that military contribution had included uh, Iowa's own regiment, uh, the 60th U.S. Colored Infantry, which was, uh, well, it was, it was shared between the state of Iowa and the state of Missouri. About half the troops were drawn from, uh, from uh, various places across southern Iowa, and the, and the, uh, and the regiment was uh, filled up with, with blacks, refugees in and around uh, St. Louis. So there was a, a, uh, there was a specific black uh, contribution from this state in the, in the war. Iowa, uh, Stone's original attitudes in some were those of virtually all mainstream Republicans in Iowa as elsewhere, but the war, particularly the quality of African Americans' participation in the Union effort, caused him to see things with a conventional post-war mix of political imperatives and simple justice. Put another way, what were originally policy necessities became transcendent virtues. Abolishing slavery became not only necessary to destroy the South's ability to wage war, but also fulfilled God's law mandating universal human kinship. Black citizenship in the South became more than the main means of consolidating Confederate defeat by protecting the freed from re-enslavement. It also became a reward for wartime loyalty to the Union. About equal suffrage in post-war Iowa, Stone admitted in July 1865 that he'd been hesitant only two weeks earlier. He wasn't sure whether, whether equal rights was the thing to do. It is, and I'm paraphrasing once again, it is true he was not in favor of putting that equal rights plank in the 1865 Republican platform because he did not think there was any practical necessity for it. Uh, but it was a fait accompli, and now he recognized that a racially impartial suffrage in Iowa was not only a necessary part of national strategy vis-a-vis -vis the South, but would also be an appropriate acknowledgement that Iowa's black politician had, population rather, black population had vicariously proved its worthiness through its sponsorship of a black combat regiment. Governor Snow, in, in, in other words, was every man as Republican. What we find in his personal attitudinal odyssey is not some you know, enormous emotional or intellectual conversion experience, but simply that he, you know, he read the newspaper, he listened to what people were saying, he observed things, and then he reflected some on what he, he saw and observed. He was not an intellectual. And he, in turn, conveyed his changed attitudes to others very forcefully, in fact, for he happened to be one of the best stump speakers around. Uh, just to give you an example of the kind of uh, speech he could, the kind of, the kind of rhetoric he com could, uh, could come out with, hear this from an 1865 Des Moines campaign speech. But you have to keep in mind that what he's talking about here is black equality. That's the topic. I'll quote him here. I say that we Republicans carried out the spirit of the Declaration of Independence in that platform resolution when we said that all men were equal before the law. Applause. We stand where Madison and Franklin and Jefferson stood when we assert that all men are equal before the law. We stand where stood the framers of the federal constitution and where the men stood who fought the battles of the revolution. Applause. I tell you this principle that all men are equal comes from the almighty God himself, and it must and will prevail. <coughs> Applause. Um, the audience response to this kind of rhetoric, you see, is, is, is charged with meaning as the words themselves. A measure of the significance of such rhetoric is whether or not important numbers of Iowa's voters actually changed their minds after listening to this. Modifying, if not their attitudes, then at least their conceptions of how they thought they should behave when it came to questions of equal rights. For example, how many who had voted no in 1857 then turned around and voted yes in 1868? Well, given the rapid growth typical of a frontier population, Iowa's electorate was necessarily very different in 1868 from what it had been 11 years earlier. It is almost, in fact, within the range of statistical possibility that 1868's referendum triumph could have been caused solely by new voters, that is, young men who had arrived in the state, or, or old men, who had arrived in the state after 1857 or who had come of voting age during the intervening years. That is, that completely different, a completely different set of voters had voted yes in 1860, 
eight and the, and the older voters were still voting, no, that's, that's almost statistically possible. Uh, that is, that without a single Iowan uh, really reversing his 1850 position on, uh, on civil rights in 1868. Well, we can test that one. Uh, the lights, please. Uh, what, what, we have, what we have here is, uh, what we have here is how how the uh, Fremont voters, how, how the Republicans of 1856 voted in 1857, and then how they voted in 1868. Uh, this is, again is uh, with this mysterious technique called the eco uh, multiple ecological regression. And what we have is the, the yes, 25, no, 11, 30. That's 100% that's there. And then 1868, 11 years later, taking into account the whole question of uh, new voters and so forth and so on. Some technicalities here I'm going over really quickly. But uh, in 1868, you see, then you have 78%. The yes vote has, in this, these are the same people, uh, technically speaking. Uh, these are the same people. In, 18, uh, in 1857, 25 percent yes. 1868, 78 percent yes. You see, a lot of them have changed their minds. Uh, there's no getting around that. The uh, something uh, in numerical terms, something like 25,000 antebellum Republicans, uh, like Governor Stone, changed their minds. Uh, something like 25,000 antebellum Republicans who had opposed equal suffrage before the war, either by voting no or by ruling off, or, or who had not turned out to vote in 1857, switched to supporting black suffrage in 1868. Now, the rest of Table 2 compares successive uh, Republican electorates on equal rights over time. That is, this is the, I'm showing you here the uh, 1856 Republican electorate, how they then voted first, the first time and then voted the second time. Uh, the rest of the table has a lot of the other electorates uh, <coughs> listed. I won't pause uh, to uh, say much about them, but I'll, I'll just show you the kind of stuff uh, one can uh, have at one's disposal to uh, address this kind of question. Uh, here's the, uh, the Lincoln electorate of 1860. You see, uh, I don't, I don't uh, move them, I don't, uh, regress them all the way to 1880 because that's 20 years and that's, that's a little implausible to do that. But when we get to uh, Lincoln's second election of 1864, uh, we see that 95% uh, of them vote yes uh, in 1868, but in 1880, uh, you see you have this fall off, uh, this, this fall off that comes, uh, that 95% that that falls to 70%, the roll off goes from 1% to 10%. Uh, the Stone voters of 1865, 93%, yes, 77, they also fall off. This is the story of the difference between 1868 and 1880. Uh, it's a, a question of being high on, yes, being egalitarian in 1868 and then having a, a decay uh, occur in this egalitarian position. And this is uh, for various, uh, various uh, Republican electorates over time. Uh, it seems reasonable to suppose the importance of party loyalties in precise political context notwithstanding that some voter groups shifted position on equal rights more readily than others. And the following table will uh, rather quickly uh, show some of the tests of this presumption. That is to say that not all Republicans are going to, are going to perform this, uh, this shift the same way as other groups of Republicans. And we can even ask, you know, what do the Democrats do? I can tell you what the Democrats do. They never do vote yes. No groups of Democrats ever go in favor of, of, uh, of equal rights. Uh, it's only the Republicans that have this, uh, this built-in um, um, potentiality, and it's uh, only with them that uh, one really uh, needs to worry uh, about any of this stuff <coughs> in, in some respects. Now, uh, let, let, me, let me run through some of this. And, and I, I guess I, okay. Let's, let's, look, let's look just for example at the workforce. Um, we can do a little bit with economic data, but not much. Uh, in Iowa, if you look at the workforce in 1856, everybody's a farmer. 
Uh, so what I did is I broke the uh, farmers down at least. I said, let's uh, let's see, let's let's take prosperous counties and poorer counties and, and divide them that way. So so I have, and and what we see is it's not too much a difference here. Uh, the, uh, the, the 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 prosperous the far the farmers let me be technically correct farmers in prosperous areas as as measured by value of livestock. For example, in 1856, you see there, uh, there, 42% uh, of those who are, who 42% um, of those who, who are qualified to vote, are, are Republicans. That is, that is a, 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 a they're more Republican than Democrats. Uh, and they are only 9% yes in 1857, uh, but and their Republicanism increases a bit uh, to over over 50%. Uh, they are now uh, much more uh, in favor of equal rights in 1868 than they were earlier. And this is true uh, really all the way down. Um, the, those in the population <coughs> who were not farmers and were in a variety of, of, uh, of occupations, and I've grouped them simply as non-farmers. Uh, really the important thing about this is uh, that uh, it, just, it just plays out the salience of, of party. That is to say, what mattered most of all with respect to equal rights questions, whether you're Republican or Democrat. And what we see is that the, the, the advance in Republicanism of, of every group here uh, is, uh, is, is informally uh, correlated with the advance in, in, uh, in progressive attitudes uh, toward equal rights. Um, table four has, has to do with uh, has to do with the, this, is, this doesn't, I'm not exhausting all the possibilities, I'm just showing you some of the, some of the more interesting ones. Now this is, this is religious groups. And here, um, the religious data come from the famous church speech, the church accommodation stuff that in, the, in this case, in the 1860 uh, United States uh, published, uh, published census. Um, and here, they are listed in, in terms of size. Now the Methodists, there are so many Iowans that still today, you know, this Methodism is the prevailing, uh, is the prevailing Iowa uh, religion, and it was true a uh, hundred and what, whatever it was years ago, uh, so that uh, I at least divided the upstate and downstate conferences of the Methodist Church in Iowa into two groups. And uh, then the Presbyterian, Baptist, Roman Catholic, and so forth. Now, what one, what one sees here is that there's a considerable amount of difference, you see, in, in how uh, these different groups uh, support or don't support equal suffrage. Uh, I won't pause to go through each group. I'll, I'll quickly summarize it uh, as I have done here. Um, um, in 1856, uh, downstate Methodists, uh, Catholics, Disciples of Christ, Episcopalians, they registered all as predominantly democratic. And uh, by 1868, all of these, but the Catholics had become decisively Republican. That is to say, the Republican Party uh, conquers, politically conquers all of these groups except the, the Catholics who remain Democrats. And the Disciples of Christ and the Lutherans in Iowa remain split between uh, the, the two parties. Yet all church groups dramatically elevated their support for equal suffrage between 1857 and 1868. Iowa's Quakers, the only group to yield more yes than no ballots in 1857, uh, and the most Republican of any denomination, they provided the steepest rise. Um, Lutherans aside, the most obvious central tendency is that each church group increased both its Republicanism and its support for equal rights. Very quickly. Uh, ethnocultural groups. Uh, these are determined by birthplace from uh, various uh, censuses, in this case the census of Iowa in 1856. Uh, New Englanders, New Yorkers, Pennsylvanians, Ohio, Southern, Irish, Germans. Um, here uh, the behaviors of these pre-war ethnocultural groups uh, are interesting. Uh, neither the Irish nor the Germans uh, gave support of any kind or any substance to black suffrage, either in 57 or 68, but the yes percentages among all the other groups rise sharply. In this table, the New Englanders play the role of the Quakers. In, in the religious table, 
uh, although they, these were not overlapping groups. Uh, Yankees were the second most Republican. They were the only group to yield more yes than no votes in 57. In 68, they increased their support of equal rights virtually to 100 percent. In fact, the Yankees and the Irish here in Iowa, as in other parts of the United States, this is no big surprise. That is, the, the data here confirm what we think was true er, uh, elsewhere. Uh, the Yankees and the Irish are kind of mirror images of each other when it comes to attitudes and behavior toward blacks. The most egalitarian, the New Englanders, uh, the most racially conservative nativity group, the Irish. Uh, one more. Table six. Here are the post-war ethnocultural groups. These data drawn from the uh, uh, the census of uh, 1870. Uh, here, uh, here, the New Englanders have become such a small proportion of Iowa's voting population they dropped out. There just aren't enough of them to to add in here. But we have, we are, uh, we are able to. Our, um, able to, to do something with the Germans that's a little bit new and different when we come to the 1870 census material. We can divide them into mainly Lutheran and mainly Roman Catholic according to what parts of Germany they come from and whether those parts of Germany were predominantly Lutheran or Catholic. See whether they're, you know, to see whether <coughs> the Germans, that the uh, religious persuasion is making it actually different. Um, well, uh, what do what does this tell us? It, uh, again, it tells us that, uh, uh, that people change their minds. Uh, the, uh, the, um, the New Yorkers and the Pennsylvanians and the Ohioans, uh, they are the most firmly pro-grant groups of 1868. They decline a good deal as politics uh, shift in the 1870s to, to concerns no longer related to the war. But these three Republican groups, yes, percentage on equal rights fell much more drastically than their enthusiasm for Republican presidential candidates. So that we have 70% decline among New Yorkers, 40%, uh, I'm sorry, 40 point decline among Pennsylvanians, over 30 point decline among Ohioans with respect to enthusiasm for black rights. In contrast, the yes percentage among the mainly Democratic Southerners improved a good bit, while among Irish and Germans it held steady. Finally, it will be noted that virtually no voter of Irish or German Catholic background cast a yes ballot in either referendum. So in the earlier, the earlier uh, data where we have Germans being uh, uh, against black suffrage, you see what, we're, what, what, that, what was being hidden there was the Germans were dividing up as they do in these data. Uh, the Lutherans are much more progressive racially uh, speaking. Uh, than, than the uh, German Catholics are. <coughs> but uh, ballot majorities for free white repeal in 1880 carry only the Pennsylvanians, the Ohioans, and the German Lutherans. Now this by no means exhausts the tabulated data, but enough is enough. I'd like to conclude by just talking about what I, th I think are some of the, of, the, of the larger meanings of this Iowa experience. Iowa's authentic Equal suffrage victory of 1868 finds little by way of application or support in the historical literature. Scholarly validation of his experience must be sought elsewhere. More fully than expected, perhaps, it is to be found in the classical behavioral literature on racial attitudes and attitude change. I won't pause to tell about each one of these, but there are some landmarks that stand forth. Um, Richard LaPierre's 1934 experiment suggesting the important distinction between attitudes and behavior. Uh, Gunnar Myrdal's elevation in 1944 of the strategic implications of the adapted uh, behavior of the, of the attitude behavior dichotomy to an ideology behavior disjunction, the so-called American dilemma. Uh, there's Robert K. Merton's 1949 modification of Myrdal, which includes the concept of the unprejudiced discriminator and the prejudiced non-discriminator. Uh, there's T.W. Adorno and his associates who in 1950 isolated truly hardcore racists as a very special case of person whose transformation requires psychotherapy. There's Gordon W. Alport's 1954 suggestion of the tripartite division of white attitudes into three large groups, uh, neurotic 
like uh, bigots, uh, ideological egalitarians, and a conforming majority that will go either way it gets the appropriate signals to go. And then finally, uh, Thomas, uh, Petty, Thomas uh, Pettigrew, who's uh, a student of Allport's, whose research based underpinning to this important Allportian theoretical formulation is provided. According to Pettigrew, only 15% of white adult Americans are uncompromising, deep-seated racists uh, whose extreme anti-black prejudices arise from authoritarian personality needs. That is, only about 15% of Americans test out as sick, as, 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 as pathogenic racists. At the other extreme, there are about 25% of Americans who test out as, 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 uh, as uh, ideologically egalitarian. They can do no other but then to see everybody as equal. So we have, the, we have these two extremes in America, says uh, Pettigrew's research. 15% the negative end, 25% the positive end. And then we have everybody else in the middle. And the middle will go anyway thinks it's supposed to go. It will vote yes, it will vote no, it will not vote at all. It depends on what you tell it to do. Now it's this conforming three-fifths, as he calls it, who are susceptible to pressure and persuasion, and therefore capable of changing their behavior from discriminatory to egalitarian in fairly short order. It doesn't take that much to do, he says. Now this Pettigrewian statement, it seems to me, serves as a kind of concise decoding of Iowa's egalitarian moment. And it validates the Iowa experience as more than something that can be, should be dismissed as out of hand as merely exceptional, nothing but a historical oddity, uh, therefore historiographically insignificant. I think the Iowa experience is very significant. Now something happened in the 1960s about these, these kinds of uh, psychological tests and, 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 and hypotheses. There came, a, a, there came an important series of ideological events that exerted an impact on this validation. Uh, the death of Martin Luther King helped fuel the shift from nonviolent civil disobedience to what came to be known as black power, which involved the conscious repudiation by mainstream black activists of the Medallian psychological strategies that had achieved the civil rights victories of the 1940s and 1950s. At the same time, all Portian psychology came to be discredited by Thomas Pettigrew's involvement as a strategy planner in the Boston school desegregation business, which, as J. Anthony Lucas reminds us, turned violent. And, uh, and, and, and Pettigrew left Harvard and, and went to uh, California. In the profession of history, meanwhile, there came to be coincidentally the rise of what August Meyer has called the new paradigm of black history, concerned less with African Americans' historical role, historic role rather, in the larger society than with the distinctiveness of their institutions, their communities, their culture. The new model of black history had an enormous impact on the historiography of the next 25 years. In its extreme form, uh, this new paradigm of black history embraced, says Meyer, a deeply felt conviction that white America is and always has been and probably always will be hopelessly and unredeemably racist. Now most of those openly espousing this, this, this very pessimistic view, most of those openly espousing this very pessimistic view have been black Afro-Americanists. Although their indignation has strongly influenced an entire generation of white historians, perhaps best exemplified in the later work of C. Van Woodward and many of his <coughs> most prestigious students. The pessimistic historical mood of such scholars, both black and white, was only exacerbated in the 1980s by President Reagan, whose posture of innocence and ability to offer mainstream America a vision of itself as innocent of racism in Shelby Steele's phrasing. Uh, further alienated black historians and those white scholars who, out of a guilty deference, depended upon black scholars for their ideological cues. Allow me a personal experience just quickly to explain what, this, what the results of this kind of thing can be. I read an early version of this paper at an annual conference on emancipation and its aftermath in New York City in, 19, in 1986. There, at some point in my presentation, 
Within the hearing of a confidant of mine, a prominent black female historian remarked to a prominent white feminist historian, quote, I'm not coming to this conference again, unquote. Well, you see, uh, what that means is, what that means is that, that the pessimists and optimists are not arguing with each other. That is, those who believe that America is unredeemably and, and, and hopelessly racist simply do not want to hear about the Iowa experience because they cannot explain it. It upsets them, it, uh, it offends them, and, uh, and, and it's going to be ignored because it simply, there, there's no place to put it intellectually into either their experience or into the, historiographic, into the, into the historical literature, which is still dominated by the, the pessimistic mood, if you will. Um, in recent years, however, what might be thought of as an optimist school, of which I guess I've, I've been identified as part of, uh, has been quietly forming among American historians of race relations. The work, for example, of J. Morgan Kauser, who uh, ironically enough is, is a C. Van Woodward student, but his work on 19th, the 19th century origins of school desegregation litigation, in which in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, blacks were black uh, court court suits against desegregated school systems were winning in, 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 in states all over the country, Louisiana, Kansas, and here in Iowa as well. It's completely not part of the literature, you see, of black protest. The blacks were not supposed to win school desegregation court cases in the late 19th century, but they were, but nobody knows about it. Nobody wants to hear about it because the prevailing Orthodoxy, you see, is one of, of uh, America as being unredeemably racist. So, uh, so there are some of us who are beginning to, uh, to assert that 19th century America had much more moral capacity for racial justice uh, than the current orthodoxy as defined by the ironic paradigm gives it credit for. But Iowa's egalitarian moment from the historian's perspective possesses aspects good, good and bad, uh, and let me really finish on this note. The upside is that it was a straightforward instance of, of a white majority in a large civil jurisdiction voluntarily relinquishing, relinquishing its assertion of black inferiority. Uh, hitherto, the, the idea of black inferiority had been a means of maintaining its own guiltlessness, its own innocence, about racial wrongdoing. Uh, Iowans uh, before 1868, as, as uh, people all over the United States could say, you see, we are innocent of wrongdoing toward blacks because they are inferior, they deserve it. See, don't blame us, that's just the way it is. By relinquishing this mythology and by admitting black adult males to the, to the, to the, to the electorate, then you see, Iowans have given up this idea, and they are in effect repudiating it. Now this is a very important act, you see. In 1868, if not exactly in 1880, Iowans self-consciously did the right thing. And in doing so, they set an example for the nation to follow, and it seems entirely correct to, to honor them, in a sense, uh, for that, for that very reason. But the downside is that Iowa's experience was not transferable elsewhere, not even to other northern states, to say nothing of transferable to where it was most desperately needed, which was the South. The most obvious difference, uh, and it doesn't take, you know, uh, a, a superior IQ to th think this through after a bit, there's a difference between Iowa and the South, and the big difference is uh, the South, the former slave state, uh, the, the region of, uh, of slavery, was that uh, was this that in the Hawkeye State there was no economic investment in black inferiority? You see, black Iowans could become full participants in the political system without disturbing the prevailing system of labor, the economic status quo. Now that's untrue in the South. Once you admit Southern blacks into the voting population, then things are going to disrupt the the attempt by white southerners to, to bring blacks into a form of slavery known as peonage and keep them there so that there's a, ch a cheap black labor supply so that one can grow cotton and raise tobacco. And it is perhaps no paradox that southern blacks would not be truly emancipated in the United States until the passage of the Civil Rights Act in, in 1964 and the Voting Rights Act in 1965, by which point 
Southern agribusiness was well on its way through mechanization to overcoming its traditional need for cheap black labor. So, so uh, African Americans in, you know, in the United States become finally emancipated just at the moment, finally, when there's, there isn't that, that heavy investment by the South in that form of cheap labor. Well, back to Iowa, one can just uh, conclude on, on this note. Uh, was the Hawkeye State an especially good place for blacks to live? Well, uh, there's a lot of evidence uh, that, uh, that this, was, uh, that th this was, re was a relatively benign place uh, for, for blacks to live. For example, uh, the Iowa's record on, on lynchings was ex exemplary. There, had, there, was a, 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 there, was a, there was a lynching of a black uh, person in Dubuque in 1840, and from then until, uh, until at least 1912, there were no other lynchings in, in, in Iowa. Uh, there were no Ill illegal uh, illegal punishments for crime in Iowa, uh, at least until uh, 1912, which which covers the which is, covers a considerable period in which there was all sorts of violence done to blacks in states like Nebraska and, and Illinois and certainly Missouri. Black sojourners from George Washington Carver to Helen Caldwell Day testified to the lack of racial discrimination they felt here. Uh, Lawrence C. Jones, after facing down a Mississippi lynch mob, certainly knew the difference between black life in Iowa and in the Deep South. The northern migrating residents of Buxton, the racially integrated Iowa coal mining town of the turn of the century years, these residents later looked back fondly on their experience and compared it unfavorably to life in Des Moines. Iowa's most famous contemporary black native, the opera star Simon Estes, grew up in Centerville, uh, on the Missouri border, a town in which the, the movie theater was racially segregated, although he and his white high school friends integrated it without incident one afternoon. But let Iowa's not, not wallow in their innocence. This is not an occasion uh, for, for celebrating Iowa's, uh, you know, Iowa's kind of special favor and, 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 and special achievement in this line. In 1875, the young man who had become baseball's first superstar, professional big league baseball's first superstar, signed with the Chicago White Sox in 1875. He became the club's player coach and then the player manager almost until the end of the century. To social historians, however, Adrian Cap Anson is most important because in the 1890s he forced the major leagues to divest themselves of their black players by refusing to let his Chicago White Sox play against teams that had black players, he single-handedly segregated big league professional baseball, a handicap that the sport would not overcome, of course, until the painful ordeal of Jackie Robinson in 1946. Good old Cap Anson, another redneck from Georgia or Alabama, you might ask. Uh, no, uh, Cap Anson was a racist born and bred in Marshalltown, Iowa. Thank you very much. Why don't those of us who have questions you'd like to 